Men, if you are like the 90 plus percent of men that we talk to, you are struggling with some kind of secret sin, even if it's a hobby, uh, something that has gripped you that you haven't broken free of. And if that's you, then you're struggling with shame. And if you have an issue with shame that's causing you to hide some sin in your life or some ha- unhealthy habit, this is the podcast for you. We're bringing my friend Ted Shimmer back on the podcast to discuss the topic of shame. And he's got some great practices and great ways for you to get through shame and to find freedom as your best version of Christ. You're going to love this episode, guys. Keep tuned in. Men in the Arena Army, we salute you. Guys, thanks for listening to this episode of the Men in the Arena podcast. I'm Jim Ramos, your host of today's show and of Spotify's number one podcast for Christian men. We are your guide to helping you become the best version of the man that God has made you to be, even while living in the stress bubble of life, raising your family and beyond. So welcome to today's show. Guys, I want to start off today's show with a man law. Today's unique. My man law and my hero story are actually from the same dude. So uh, thank you, Ethan, from Alberta, Canada, for bringing it today. So uh, Ethan's man law is this, and I just I laughed out loud because I'm pretty sure I've said this before, not realizing that it's a man law. And he says this, there's no such thing as strong coffee, just weak men. <laughs> That's good. That is so good. So thanks a lot for that one, Ethan. And then Ethan also wrote and he said this. He said, I've been listening nonstop to the podcast since summer, and I can't get enough. My two closest buddies and I have really been encouraged by your call to men to step into the roles of leadership that God has for them and their families and in their church and beyond. You've given us many conversation starters and encouraged us to share our burdens with each other and spur one another on daily. So thank you. Your willingness to speak over men on all issues without shame or fear has been a game changer in my walk with Christ and my relationship with my brothers in Christ. Hey, Ethan, bro, thank you so much, man. If you hit us up at info at menarena.org with your physical address, we'll shoot you some swag as our way to say thank you. So thanks, guys, for making the Men Arena podcast Spotify's number one podcast for Christian men. Guys, I'm, I'm excited to bring Ted Shimmer back on our podcast. This is part two. If you remember uh, the last podcast episode, it was so powerful dealing with the root causes of a pornography addiction that I wanted to bring Ted back on the show and discuss the topic of shame. But first, let me read Ted's bio. Ted Shimmer is a Dallas Theological Seminary trained pastoral sex edition professional supervisor who has mentored men since 1991. He helps people overcome the bondage of pornography in the context of making disciples. I love that. Ted is the founder of The Freedom Fight and the author of the book, The Freedom Fight, The New Drug and the Truths That Set Us Free. Today is part two. As I shared earlier, we're going to deal with this issue that guys don't like to discuss. This might be the secret issue of the secret issues, the issue of shame. So it's great to have you here uh, with us again, Ted. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Jim, it's great to be with you, man. I've been looking forward to it. Yeah, me too, man. You know, we've had a lot of guests come on and talk about addictions on various levels, but when you went into the root causes, that was really impactful just for me as a guy, because you hear a lot of things, but you don't go, you don't realize what the root cause is. Like, why uh, is this guy doing this? Or why am I doing this? Or why do I respond this way? Or when I, uh, feel this way. Why do I respond this way? So that was really, really good. And I've been asking myself that question, you know, okay, why am I doing this or what what, this, in this situation, what triggered it, you know, and where did it come from? So it's been really good for me as well. But you know, this topic is shame. You know, when, when we, when I read the book, I thought, you know, this is the secret topic of the secret sin, you know, guys, don't want to talk about shame because when they talk about shame, they have to deal with the secret they're keeping, which is this, this addiction, whether it's uh, chewing tobacco or alcoholism or smoking or, you know, pornography or, or whatever. And so I'm really excited to come on, uh, have you on the show and to discuss this issue of shame. Yeah. And you're right. It's, it's a topic uh, we don't like to discuss because once you start getting into, Hey, what are those secrets that, I've swore I'm never going to tell anybody, and uh, but the enemy definitely uses this topic, uh, man, to keep men and women in the shadows and 
really from living the full life that God wants us to live. Yeah. And I want to be clear. So the book, your book, The Freedom Fight, which is a, it's an outstanding book. I love this book. Uh, this book deals with sex addiction, but this topic really is for any addiction. Am I right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, and those, uh, those root causes of addiction apply yes. to any addiction in, in shame is man, one of those massive drivers and really what, what most addiction experts would say is, you know, shame is typically the strongest of the drivers of addiction for whatever, you know, the addiction is going to be. Um, wow. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a significant topic for sure. Well, I hate to put you on the spot and I'm going to help you here, but can we go back? I know shame is root cause number five. Can you walk us through the other, uh, the other five out of the six? Yes. Um, and so the first is access. So in a pornography addiction, it's uh, the sexual eye society. Hey, it's everywhere. The addicted brain um, is the second uh, root. Um, isolation is the third. Negative emotions is the fourth that, you know, people medicate their negative emotions instead of processing them. And then uh, shame is the fifth and trauma is the sixth root of addiction. Yeah. And I really appreciate it. you guys. If you haven't listened to the episode with Ted that we released about three weeks ago, maybe a month ago now, you need to go back. You need to listen to that. It'll help you a lot, but let's deal with shame. So you, you spent three chap of the six root causes. You spent three chapters on the topic of shame. And that really caught my eye when an author goes off script and extends the script, you have to say to yourself, okay, there's a reason why this is so powerful. So, uh, and I'm going to reread a quote out of your book that was very powerful for me. It's you said this shame was the most consistent key driver of unwanted sexual behavior. Shame convinces us that we are unwanted and we pursue behavior that confirms it to find freedom, disarm the power of shame. Shame is the most interconnected and influential root of addiction. So when you said it's interconnected, it's the most interconnected. Can you explain this, this concept of the river of shame? Cause that was a very po powerful concept uh, in your chapters. Yeah. And, you know, just, just like the Mississippi river, it, you know, when it ends up in the Gulf of Mexico, man, it's a roaring river. Yep. But it starts as just a trickle. And, you know, the different tributaries that flow into it, man, you know, continue to, to make it expand and, and grow into the powerful river that it is. And really, that's a great analogy for shame because there's a lot of tributaries that feed into it. Um, that add to the shame, you know, trauma is, you know, one of those things that, you know, can, you know, flow and, and add into the shame in, you know, the secret life when somebody has an addiction, man, that, that in and of itself uh, is shame causing. It's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hey, this area of my life, uh, man, I'm living in defeat I can't keep my commitments to myself, to God, my spouse. Um, and all of that just, man, multiplies the shame in, you know, the shame messages that, you know, can dominate our thinking. And shame becomes an identity. It's not mm -hmm. just that I feel a certain way, um, but it it's becomes who I am. Um, and, and that's one of the saddest things I've seen, Jim, just on this topic of shame is that, you know, believers, people who should be living out of their identity in Christ as an mm -hmm. exalted son or daughter of the King. Instead, shame causes us to live out of this shame identity and uh, instead of our identity in Christ. And, and so it's, it's significant on a number of levels, but when that happens just on a spiritual level, um, once again, it, it keeps us in the shadows instead of, you know, pursuing a vibrant walk with God and, you know, being a part of building his kingdom. So what I'm hearing you say is this shame can lead us to make this statement. I am a sex addict instead of I have a sex addiction, but I am a child of God. Is that yeah, what you're saying? Absolutely. Um, and, and that's one of the things that's, that's really important 
is the the person um, that's living in shame. They allow their addiction to define them. Yes. And, and what you just said is so crucial is, hey, my addiction or my regrettable you know, decisions or behavior, that doesn't define me. Jesus Christ has defined me, my worth, my significance, um, my identity. And when a person loses that peace, uh, man, shame can just dominate them. And so it's so, so critical to understand that perspective well, you know what's interesting, and I don't want to go down a rabbit trail here, so t- please don't let me. <laughs> I'm the interviewer <laughs> asking the guests to keep me on task. My <laughs> wife and I have um, some key relationships with several uh, people in our community that are actual practice the homosexual lifestyle. And so they say, I am a homosexual. And we say, you are not a homosexual. You're, you're practicing a homosexual lifestyle. And, and, and the sad thing about this lifestyle is they, their whole identity is wrapped up in their sexuality. And s- instead of breaking free of that and saying, that is not who I am, that's something I do. Now I realize we all have propensities, but this, the tragedy in that lifestyle is they identify very powerfully with their sexuality as, as a part of who they are. And that's, that's exactly bipolar of who God has created them to be. And so that there's a tragedy there, but when you, and I don't want to go into that, but I, I do want to ask you this question. You talked about this uh, river, this river that starts off with a couple trickles coming in and then the river grows more and more powerful as we get downstream. So in my brain, I thought, okay, is Ted saying then that if we don't address this issue of shame, the propensity of shame is to grow more and more powerful to our ruin if we don't deal with it because the propensity of shame as these tributaries flow in is to get more and more powerful and have more uh, strength and a more breadth and more width and more depth. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. It, and wow. And you know, and that's, um, that's where it's leading us. Um, you know, it's interesting when you look at shame's first mention in the Bible, it, right after Adam and Eve sinned, they hid from God and they hid from one another. And, you know, if you think about, man, how important relationships are, one of the, the effects of shame is it keeps us in hiding. We start hiding from God. We start hiding from one another. And, man, we become isolated. And, you know, isolation, you know, obviously that's related to, you know, one of one of the root drivers. Um, But man, the power of shame to do that. And we see it, you know, in chapter three of Genesis, man, the the powerful effect of shame that you think about something that can cause you in a perfect world, in a perfect relationship with God, you start hiding from him. Yes. From the one who can bring you fullness and joy and then you start hiding you know from the the greatest gift he's given you your spouse and man just the the close relationships um and so that's man that's the the diabolical and even demonic nature of shame man it, it wow. keeps us uh from those things that give us life well, you know, it's interesting. I had to, I, I you're going to appreciate this as an Arkansas Razorback, Razorback <laughs> linebacker. But when I was a sophomore in high school, I was playing varsity football and the boys thought it'd be really funny to throw me out of the locker room, buck naked, man. And I got, as soon as they threw me outside, Ted, there's a girl standing there, man, I couldn't cover up and bend over. I was down here like this and she's trying to get a peek, you know, but, but it, I, you know, when I look at Adam and Eve, you know, we're the only creatures in all of the universe that God created in his image. And he created us to walk upright with our sex organs exposed. Now we're the only creatures besides Bigfoot that does that, you know? And so, you know, so we're, we're created to walk upright and exposed and on display and without shame, but shame causes us to hunch over and cover up. And that's the die. Like you, I love what you said. It's the diabolical nature of shame. It's just so it's, I I, want to build a case against shame before we jump in here and crucify it. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, Hey, so I want to, jump back a little bit and i want you to in your in your book you define shame how would you 
for our listeners define shame in a practical way? You know, and I think sometimes it's it's helpful, um, you know, to compare it to guilt uh, because we understand guilt. Yes. Guilt, guilt says I've done bad, but shame says I am bad in this. So there is a self-loathing at the core of shame. You know, mm. guilt can be a good thing because, man, it shows us our sin and we can confess and repent and correct it uh but shame it it condemns us but it also doesn't give us hope it tells us that we are worthless and we can't change is you know the message of shame um and so i think it's you know really important um you know to recognize this and i think most of most of your hearers your listeners you know, can resonate because a lot of times the shame messages are things that we repeat with negative self-talk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it could be something that we recall that our dad told us or somebody told us or a coach told us or, you know, that, man, it was a, a shameful statement that we keep alive in our own minds that, man, I knew I could never do this or, man, I was always going to be worthless or, man, I would never amount to anything or, man, I'm always, you know, a failure. Those are sh different forms of shame messages. Um, and, you know, again, it's there's a self-loathing, a self-hatred at the core of it. So what I'm hearing you say is I'm hearing you go back to earlier in the podcast when you say where guilt is a where guilt is is something that convicts us or shows us truth of our actions shame leads us to an identity crisis yeah. so it's, it's going back to this identity and i can't be free your book again your book the freedom fight i can't be free in christ if my identity says i'm these things that aren't about freedom in christ but they're about shaming myself and negative self talk yep Exactly. Wow, that's um, that is so powerful. I, I really hope these guys are listening to this right now. These are guys that are covering up secrets, that are that are living in shame, that have a a false identity wrapped around their life based on their actions. Because this is a game changer, literally. Yeah. So absolutely. so so how does so how how let's su summarize this before we jump into some points here. How does shame keep us from finding freedom? Well, you know, it keeps us from from having hope. Um, and, you know, one of one of the things, you know, related to shame, you know, as an example, um, when a person has a shame identity, um, negative self, you know, negative emotions, there's a lot of negative emotions that come from that. So as an example, um, man, if I'm in a meeting and I throw out an idea and man, people don't like it. And some, they choose a different idea. You know, somebody who's secure and who they are in Christ, it's not a big deal. But somebody with a shame identity, man, that can be crippling. Yes. And all of a sudden, what, you know, should have been something, you know, hey, oh yeah, dude, that was a better idea than mine. You know, it's not a big deal. Man, all of a sudden, man, those voices, it's like, dude, I'm, that's horrible. And all of a sudden, the self-doubt, Man, the the emotions, man, the negative emotions that come out of that. Oftentimes, you know, when I work with guys who are struggling with a porn addiction, man, it could be something little like that that just spins them down into a spiral of being binging, you know, on whatever their addictive substance is. Um, but it's all related. You know, man, to this, the fact that they're living out of a shame identity instead of their identity in Christ. And, um, and man, it's it's so powerful. And, you know, we may get into this later, but I think it's, you know, instructive, instructive for us to remember that when the Apostle Paul was addressing the Ephesian church, you know, they were stuck in sexual bondage. And he got to that in chapter four and five. But he spent the first three chapters reminding them of who they are in Christ, because that's the foundational piece. 
And that's so important for us to recognize. It's not, hey, I want to kind of just fix, you know, the outward behavior and move some things around. But, you know, Paul reminded us, hey, the foundation is our identity in Christ. And that's what makes shame, man, such a powerful weapon for the enemy is because, man, it attacks that very foundation. Well, it's really interesting. My wife and I just got back from Greece and I stood on Mars Hill. Huh. And I envisioned myself, you know, what Paul saw. It was just a beautiful experience. But, you know, it's really interesting in the Corinthian church. Those guys were jacked up yeah. and the Corinthian. <laughs> but the, what people don't realize is they were they were very normal by society standards. Yeah. Uh, women were objectified. Uh, the you know the guys would regularly go to the temple to practice worship with a temple prostitute. Uh, sexual the, the sexual environment in greece was possibly i would argue worse than it is today it was because it wasn't it, online it was the real thing and so wow. christianity was the first the, the great thing that christianity brought to culture was this uh thing called chastity you know one wife one woman you know and so but it's really interesting in corinthians to me because what you're saying is true here is this jacked up church with these jacked up guys you got kids sleeping with their stepmom you know and he, yeah. the first thing he does, he goes, hey, you're saints. Yeah. He calls them saints in those first four chapters. I'm like, they're not saints. They're pathetic. <laughs> but that's exactly. God speaking, right? God's saying, I see beyond your sin, and I see, be I see your guilt. But I see beyond your shame, and the blood of my son Jesus covers that. Because, you know, flip over to Romans 8, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So it's it's a beautiful thing that God sees saints in the midst of us being sinners because God identifies with us through the blood of his son, Jesus. I hope I'm being theologically, absolutely. I hope oh, I'm being, yeah. you're a DTS guy. I'm hoping being theologically <laughs> accurate here. <laughs> no, absolutely, man. Absolutely. I love it. Yeah. It's a beautiful, it's, a, and this is, there's so, so much freedom here, but I want to, what I love about your book is you really dive into not only the root, but you dive into some practical ways that you kind of take the guys through a full spectrum. And so I want to dive into some very practical ways that guys can overcome shame as directed in your book. And so on page 29, you walk men through four practices to defeat shame. And so these are actual things that guys can do. So I'm going to lay them out and I'm going to let you explain them. Does that sound okay? Yep. Sounds good. Okay. So the first thing a guy can do, the first thing a guy can practice, and I got to rephrase that because we have more and more women listening to our show. I don't want to ignore them because we have women listening to to you know, help their men. We have women <laughs> listening to understand their men, and we have women listening, quite frankly, because they want help, and and they know that we these topics are really important for men and women. So, so, so even for you ladies. So your first point or your first practice to defeat shame is renewing your mind. Yes, and you know Paul talks about this in Romans twelve and also in Ephesians uh, four. Um, but, you know, once again, you know, as we think, you know, really on a spiritual warfare front, it's important. You know, Paul told us in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, that spiritual warfare happens primarily in the mind. Yep. And that strongholds must be destroyed. And because a stronghold is a lie we believe about ourselves, God or others. And shame is one of those lies. And so part of renewing the mind is replacing those strongholds with the truth of God. Yes. Um, and so as a practical example, man, the next time that negative self-talk comes up, you know, Paul says in that passage, take every thought captive and make it obey Christ. And so, hey, when a thought comes up and said, man, you're worthless, you're a failure, you know, you're never going to amount, man, God's disgusted with you. Man, that's a lie. Yep. So it's taking those lies captive and renewing our mind with the truth and, and, you know, the, the different truth statements about that. We are saints in Christ. We've been forgiven. We are justified. We are blameless and holy. Um, that we have a future and a hope that in Christ, we are more than conquerors. And when we begin to, we don't just let those negative thoughts run through unchallenged, we take them captive. You know, when Paul uses that word captive, it, it literally comes from the, the root word at spear point. It's like, 
man, when a thought comes across our mind, man, we're taking it at spear point. We're, That's we're, awesome. We're, we're determining, hey, is this friend or foe? And man, if it's one of those negative self talks, we gotta, we gotta, man, give that to God and replace it with the truth. And, and so that's a very practical thing. And I would encourage your listeners, man, start recording the negative self-talk because there's probably three or four or five statements that in one form or another, you repeat to yourself, man, write those down mm. and then write the truth of God that destroys that. And, you know, ma making that just a daily practice. So when, when that comes, you know, Paul talks in Ephesians 6 about the shield of faith that, you know, protects us from the flaming arrows of the evil one. Well, those are some of the flaming arrows of the evil one. And man, having that shield of faith um, is huge. So renewing the mind is that, man, important uh, first step in, you know, replacing lies with truth. That's so good, man. The sword. I love that. I've never heard that illustration before. The sword. Put it up against the, you know, take it captive <laughs> and the shield, right? Uh, yeah. and, and in your in your discourse there, you quoted some great verses for guys to memorize: Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, uh, Romans eight verses thirty seven to thirty eight. So guys, check those out. Uh, it, memorize those. Uh, Philippians four eight is another great one. Uh, those are way that is how you take thoughts captive. So that's I'd never heard that explained that way before, Ted. So that's really good. Thank you. So your second way that men sh or people should practice uh, to defeat shame is to allow, uh, allow it's allowing shame to remind us when we drift. Now explain that. Yeah. So what does it mean? So that's a practice. So I'm going to practice this, this mentality that I'm going to allow shame to remind me when I drift. Yes. And so and this is this is an important one, and, and and really we could relate this to renewing the mind. It's just taking opportunities, man, to replace lies with truth. And so, yes. as an example, you know that that example I gave earlier. Hey, the person in a meeting uh, whose idea gets shot down, they pick somebody else's, and it's like, man, why am I so defensive? Or if somebody makes a comment, and it's like, man, you find yourself getting defensive in those moments. Man, those are, it's good to go, man, okay, why am I getting defensive about this? Mm. Okay, let me evaluate what's going on here. Well, obviously, I'm getting my significance and worth more from the opinions of people than the opinions of God. Because, man, what they say means more than it should. And so in those moments, when that shame comes, cry, you know, creeping back in or those negative self-talk, it's like, okay, what's going on here? And it's an opportunity, uh, you know, to acknowledge and, you know, really identify wrong thinking and man, a wrong place of, Hey, where I get my significance and worth and replace it with the truth and man, make it a prayer. Lord, help me to care more about what you say about me and what you've said about me in your word and allow that um, you know, to identify me and shape my significance and Lord help me not to, you know, uh, allow my performance or the opinions of others, um, you know, to mean too much. And so those are opportunities, uh, you know, again, to replace lies with truth and renew our minds. Well, in, in your book, when you address in detail, the six root causes of, uh, an addiction, you have it's really neat because you lay it out. Here's the here's the root, here's the lie, here's the truth. And so guys can go back and reread that because what you're that's exactly what you explained in the book. So that's really good. So when I experience shame, I have to go, okay, I'm ident I have to identify it first, right? Okay, I'm in a shame mindset. Why am I there? You know, what lie brought me there? Because I'm only gonna go into a shame mindset because of a lie. And yeah. then what's the truth? to get me out of it. Is that what I'm hearing? Yep. Okay. Yep, exactly. So then number three then is I, I number these out because my personality type could care less, but there are certain personality types. Like <laughs> you said four, where was, where was you went to two from two to four. They get all nervous. I want to help them to not get too anxiety ridden. So, so number three is to live our new identity by faith. Yeah. And so, you know, cause it's one thing, and this is man, again, one of the diabolical aspects of shame 
is, and again, this is probably one of the saddest things I see as I work with believers stuck in addiction is, man, the shame identity taking over um, because it makes them numb to the love of God. Mm. And so they can know it intellectually, but man, they don't really feel it. It's just an intellectual exercise. Oh yeah, God loves me. And um, and so it's not enough just to say, well, hey, in his word, he calls me his child and says I have an inheritance and that I'm beloved of God. I was reading uh, just yesterday in John where Jesus said, the father himself loves you. Um, and so those can just be words on a page. And for so for people stuck in shame, that's often what it is. And so it's important not to just let it stay there, but to say, you know, man, claim the promise. God, I want to I want to live like this is true. Lord, you know, help me, you know, by faith to live this way. Uh, to live in the boldness and the confidence that, that this kind of identity, you know, should give me. Um, and so by faith, hey, I'm I'm going to step out like it's really true, like I believe it. And because when we live in the confidence of who we are in Christ, you know, one of the realities of living by faith is we're more we're more open and honest. Um you know, back in college, uh, you know, I was an image manager, you know, more than I am today. But a big reason I was an image manager is, man, my performance and the opinions of others meant more to me than they should have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But as I've grown in who I am in Christ, in my identity in him, man, I, I can be more vulnerable. I can share, you know, confess a sin. I can share a mistake or a weakness. Um, and so those are opportunities to live by faith, um, you know, and who we are in Christ instead of, you know, living by a shame identity. Yeah. I really want to talk about this vulnerability. So I'm just going to give the guys number four, number four is, and you've already went through this and alluded to this numerous times, but guys, it's just asking God for help, ask God for help. So there are your four things, four ways to practice this uh this mindset of defeating shame but i want to i want to dive into vulnerability you had a powerful statement on page 235 of your book and you said this vulnerability defeats shame now that is a big fat bold statement so so explain that <laughs> I, when i read that i was like man that is like you just punched me in the face so so uh, i when i love being punched in the face so talk to me about this what does that mean vulnerability defeats shame. I want to add the word every time, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, well, and, and again, I mean, I'll, I'll take us back to Genesis three when Adam and Eve sinned and their shame kept them in hiding. Mm -hmm. um, man, it's the vulnerability meant to step out of the shadows and, you know, be honest and open when, when we do that, you know, that's part of what it means to live by faith, you know, back to the second point is, hey, I'm stepping out as if it is true that I'm forgiven, that, you know, I'm, you know, perfect in Christ and blameless in him. Um, and so vulnerability is powerful because shame has kept us in hiding with the lie, man, if people really knew you, they would reject you. Yep. If yep. people really knew your junk, man, they would, they would reject you and wouldn't want to be around you. But what vulnerability does is it turns that out on its head that, Hey, and first of all, Hey, I need to be vulnerable with God and then vulnerable with some trusted friends. Um, and being honest and open, um, James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And so that's, that's a simple and yet powerful truth that when we confess, man, the scripture says that's what starts the healing process. Yes. That's where healing begins. 
when we get the sin out in the open, man, that's that's where healing begins. And so, um, yeah, it's so so critical to practice vulnerability. In uh, you know, the Apostle Paul had a lot to say on that, which we can get into in a minute. Um, but just on that topic, how often would you say shame is attached to a secret? How 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 do secrets? you know, keeping secrets, secret sin and shame. Are they like brothers? Are they two sides of the same coin? How do they interact yeah. together? Yeah. I think two sides of the same coin would be, you know, accurate. It's the reason I keep secrets is because of shame. Yeah. Shame keeps me in hiding. Um, and yet, man, just, just as James told us, it's when I bring that out into the open. Yep that man healing starts um you know alcoholics anonymous um man they have, they have a one of the the mantras they have that i think you know really captures this is you are only as sick as your secrets yep yep and, and so it's like man if i've got a secret man that there's a sickness there you know, you know and i think you know james 5 16 would yep. you know agree with that and so just recognizing um, the need to bring it into the light. Um, Paul talks about this in Ephesians 4, that we need to live in the light. And man, it's it's so critical, um, you know, to defeat shame because, yeah, secrets and shame go hand in hand. Yeah, I, pre I appreciate that clarification because I I'm thinking, OK, the things that I have or hold as a secret when those things occur, that is a shame that is a shame response to a secret sin. Well, when that is confessed, it goes away. Yep. You know, so that is very powerful. So let's talk about ways that guys can defeat the shame thing, way, ways they can practice, because I don't think this comes as naturally for men as women. Vulnerability. Yeah. So I think for men, they need a, they need a, you know, a, a, a game script. You know what I mean? Yes. They need to, okay, what, what, give me five plays <laughs> that I can put in my playbook that can help me defeat shame with vulnerability. So yeah. you've got five, uh, you know, five cards in your deck. You've got five plays in your playbook here for guys. The first one, and this is on page 245 of, of your book. The first one, I'll, I'll just read them out and I'll let you explain them is commit to living. This is so good, by the way, I laughed when I read this. Cause I'm like, this is such a dumb moment for guys, but it's <laughs> something that has to be said. Hey man, commit to living in reality, bro. <laughs> I added the bro part. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I, and I think that's, you know, important. Um, whenever there's an addiction, you know, shame causes us to deny, minimize, and rationalize. Mm. Because we don't want to have to come face to face with the reality. And... And so recognizing, you know, the scripture says, man, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Mm -hmm. That's our heart. Yep. And, and so, you know, just recognizing that in our tendency uh, to deny, minimize and rationalize that, hey, if I'm going to walk in, in freedom um, in, in my identity in Christ, I need to live in reality. And so being brutally honest, um, you know, with our sin, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the scriptures also tell us in uh, Proverbs uh, 29 that uh, he who conceals his transgression will not prosper, mm. but he who confesses and forsakes it will find mercy. Wow. And God is there waiting to unleash mercy on you. But when we cover up, we keep ourselves from experiencing the mercy of God that he wants to unleash in our life. And, um, and so, man, it's, yeah, it's just so, so important. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you something I did, um, you know, that was, that was helpful because this, living a vulnerability was definitely not natural for me. Um, and I got some feedback from some people, um, you know, different points like, man, 
you know, hey, we don't feel like you ever, you know, open up or share, or, you know, man, kind of, you know, share a weakness. And, and so I, I recognize, man, this was an issue. And so I made it a goal that every week I was going to confess a sin and share a weakness. And so at the end of the week, I could say, hey, did I confess a sin? Did I share a weakness, you know, with somebody? Um, but it got me in the mindset that, hey, this is this is a, a godly practice. Mm -hmm. um, and as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, man, my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly, gladly boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. You know, from Paul's perspective, he was like, hey, I want to I want to brag about my weaknesses, because when I'm honest and open and I'm living in reality about my weaknesses, then I'm going to be more apt to lean into the power of Christ instead of trying to, you know, fake it in my own power. Yeah. And you know what's interesting about that, Ted, is that when we boast about our weaknesses, the power of Christ often manifests in the people of Christ. People come, because I mean, I've got so many weaknesses, not necessarily <laughs> sins, but just weaknesses. Yeah. And God just brings people to cover my weaknesses. But if you don't expose those, people don't think they're, 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 they exist. So yeah. I think this is really important that God will send the people to help you. We just have to confess where we're weak. That's, and we're made yeah. strong through other believers, through other who, and we're going to talk about this at the end of the show, because you've got a great recipe for guys to come together and be strong made strong together by confessing their weaknesses, but we're going to save that to the very end. So number two is ask the why question. Yes. Um, and so when we, when we, you know, see a tendency in us to cover up when we're like, Hey, I feel like I should share this, but I'm not. Or somebody's like, Hey man, how's it going? And you're like, man, good. But it's really not. Um, mm -hmm. It's important to ask the why question. Why am I, you know, hiding this? Or, hey, why did I kind of stretch the truth there um, when they asked me how things were going or when they asked me how this thing went and I've made myself look better than I should have and made somebody else look worse? Man, ask the why question. It's like, okay, what's going on here, Lord? Am, am I, once again, looking for my identity off of other people's approval or off my performance. Um, and so, man, identifying that. So then we can, you know, be honest and be honest with God, be honest with ourselves and with others and, you know, be able to confess. And so, man, asking that why question when we sense the, the, need, the need or desire to cover up, to hide, to shade the truth, to stretch the truth, man, Asking that why question is important because that's, you know, we can, we have an opportunity to confess at a deeper level um, and get to the, you know, some of the root causes. Well, and it's interesting because asking the why question transcends sin. If I'm in a group of dudes and we're all talking and, and I'm going, oh, so you played for the Razorbacks? Okay. Oh, D1. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, how much you bench, man? Or, you know, and we start, you know, <laughs> yeah. we, we start kind of going back and forth. And so I, I always ask myself this question when I get into, I call this a pissing contest. When I get into a pissing <laughs> contest with another guy, I'm like, why am I doing that? Yeah. What, what, what in me, what stirred up insecurity in me that led me to that point? Because, because God said the meek will inherit the earth. God said, you know, God wants me to be humble. You know, Philippians two, three is very clear about that. And so when I'm rising up in pride, why am I doing that? So this why question really transcends sin. But yes. I think this is a, and it transcends vulnerability, but we have to ask that question. Why am I unwilling to confess my sin? Why am I unwilling to uh, confess if I've had a failure, right? Yeah. Oh, I did the big confession, right? I did the big confession. And then six months later I fell, right? Well, why did I confess that? Yep. You know, this is, that's, that's a powerful, that point two is very powerful. And I, I just don't want to walk away without guys realizing we got to ask that question. It's an easy question to ask. It's a hard question to answer. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, so as these guys journey, uh, they they're turning the pages of this uh, vulnerability playbook play. Number three is 
share your, uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to, it's, I'm going to word it a little bit differently. Share your addiction story. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, for the guy who has an addiction, man, that's a powerful thing for you, but it's also powerful for those who hear it. Yes. Um, you know, I don't know how many times I've, you know, heard a guy's, a, you know, pornography addiction story or even another addiction story, but it was somebody else's courage when they heard somebody's story and they, man, talked about, man, their failures in this area, but then, you know, how they eventually found freedom. Um, man, it gave them the courage for themselves to step out and, and begin to share. Um, so your, your addiction story is important for you, but don't underestimate how God's going to use that um, to spur other believers, other people on to also step out of the shadows. Um, but it's a powerful thing. It's a, it's a step of faith. It's scary. Um, but it's man, an opportunity to, step out and trust God. God, I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to share my weakness. I'm going to confess my sin because I trust you. Your word says you bring healing when that happens. And mm -hmm. I'm going to trust that you're going to do that. So Ted, I'm going to, in the book, you talk about this throughout the book with pastors and Christian men. Uh, my digital marketing consultant for our ministry uh, is a female and she sees everything that happens on our social media platforms. She estimates that eighty percent of the men who are engaged in our pod, in our, in our, in our tribe, and there's about a hundred thousand different men a week. Wow. So she estimates that eighty percent have either a porn addiction, a porn problem, or they're hobbyists with porn. And these are Christian men. Yeah. So my question to you is, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to build a big picture here. So. Do you, do you think she's accurate there? Because I don't. I think it's 90%. Yeah. <laughs> but well, what do you think? A, <laughs> it's funny you say that because I was going to say, yeah, that sounds a little low. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. So so you and I are in agreement, right? So yeah. if let's say 90% of guys in, we're talking about church guys here. Yeah. I would say 90% of guys who are, I'm going to put them in a window, 70 to 7, 17. Those guys have had some kind of, you know, experience, hobby, addiction, whatever with porn. And I'm saying that because this should open the floodgates for guys to go, Hey man, most of the guys in the room with me are struggling with this issue. Yeah. So when I expose my issue, I'm allowing men and giving my bros permission to expose what probably is their issue. Yep, exactly. So, well, and that, and that's, that's where it becomes, uh, you know, powerful Jim is when believers, you know, begin to step out of the shadows and man, one, one person's story can inspire somebody else to step out and man, how God can use that man to bring healing. Um, and it's, man, it's powerful. Um, you know, if you look at the history of revivals, um, it's almost one of the, the factors that's almost always a part of it is, man, the confession and repentance of Christians that, man, that's, that is at the heart of it is man, people, you know, you look at in, in the book of Ephesians or in Acts when it, Paul was in Ephesus, man, they started bringing all their books, you know, their witchcraft and started burning them and. Uh, but man, there was, there was a revival taking place that man, people's hearts were, were convicted and, uh, man, I, I agree. It's man, when it, when that begins to happen and people begin to step out of the shadows, God uses that in a powerful way to encourage others to do the same. Yeah. That's really interesting, man. I would say in the history, I'm reading church history in plain language right now for the mm. second time, it's about 700 pages. It's a textbook, but it's <laughs> really interesting to me. That in history, when the church repents, it grows. And when Christianity is illegal, it grows. Yeah. So those two <laughs> things, I'm a huge proponent of making Christianity illegal and, you know, dying for our faith. <laughs> I'm also a huge proponent of, hey, you know, let's break the statues. Let's break. Let's have Alexander the coppersmith go cop crazy because he's going out of business because not buying, you know what I mean? That, which is what yeah. we see in the Bible. So this is really good. Well, so 
Yeah, I just wrote a blog. You're going to appreciate this. I was a high school linebacker. That was what I was at heart. You were a college linebacker. And uh, I wrote a I wrote a blog and I did a sermon on this on filling the gaps that a linebacker's job is to fill gaps and a defensive lineman's job is to create a situation where the linebacker is free to fill gaps. So uh, you would have loved this message. It was a really <laughs> fun message to give anyway. And I talked about near back to guard reads and two hat reads and flow reads and all these things. You, you would have loved it anyway. <laughs> But one of the things that we've recognized in our ministry, you know, like I said, we've got about 100,000 people who follow us on any given week, and we've got probably way less. I'm just going to say way less. I'll be vulnerable. I bet we don't even have 500 guys in small groups. So we have this huge gap between our followers and guys that are fully engaged. Now, now I'm not saying they could be in other small groups and who knows, you know, so, but that's a massive gap, right? So as a linebacker, I want to fill that gap, right? As a visionary, yeah. I want to I want to plug that hole. I want to plug that leak. Your fourth point, and I, I'm just I'm gonna tee, I'm teeing this up for you, man. I'm putting the ball on the tee, <laughs> or I'm gonna put the running back chest up with his <laughs> numbers showing. How about that? Yes. So so number four in our practice to become vulnerable is join a small group. Yes. Well, and this you know, and this is critical, you know, and as you look, even you know, secular. Um, Christian man, you know, if so, if somebody is in an addiction, you know, the addiction experts say, man, that person is going to get free when they get into a small group, and so it's just it's critical um, at so many levels as believers. You know, we know the the importance of it. You know, man, gathering with other believers so we can encourage and spur one another. Um, but man, it's in these small groups that we can practice vulnerability. It's in these small groups that we have a, a group of people that we can trust to practice confessing our sin. It's in these small groups that we have people that, you know, when we are vulnerable and, and man, instead of experiencing the rejection, man, we experience the acceptance and encouragement. That's when shame begins to lift. Um, because, you know, a person can't be fully loved, you know, unconditionally until they're fully known. Yes. But, you know, when we, when we don't have a group of people where we're fully known, man, we can't experience that, that unconditional love of God. And it's, you know, so often, man, that acceptance and love from other people is what helps us have the capacity to experience that acceptance and love of God at a, at a whole different level. Um, and so, man, it's, it's really, you know, critical, man, to be a part of a small group. And so, you know, in our program, you know, people can go through it individually. Um, you know, we coach people up on, Hey, how do you get an accountability partner? You got to have an accountability partner go through it, but man, we're, we're preaching, all the way through, hey, you got to get, you got to go through this in a small group because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. these, the truths of God, um, man, can be, you know, more effectively applied and practiced in a small group. And all the principles we're talking about, they're just multiplied when you have a small group to experience them in. Well, and when I read your bio and, and I re read your book, it was very clear to me if I'm if I'm speaking something that's out of turn here, please correct me. But it was very clear to me that your heart for men is not dealing with porn addiction. Your heart for men is to disciple men to become free men in Christ. Is yes. that an accurate statement of you? Absolutely. You know, um, Hebrews 12, 1 says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with endurance the race set before us. Yep. So our vision man, is to, man, release guys from the weight and sin, you know, and porn is a massive one for men. It's, you know, the, the, the most pervasive that we experience. But the bigger vision is, man, we want people to find freedom so they can run free after Christ and his purposes. Yes. God has a race for us to run. Um, and so the goal isn't just freedom, but man, it's to run free after Christ and his purposes. And, and, and so that's why, 
you know, it's, it's so important to, to and have that vision of discipleship and, and really that's what, you know, our program is based on. Well, you know, it's interesting, Ted, our part of our, part of our vision is that men would become their best version. And I had a guy ask me to speak at an event and he goes, can you, you know, not talk about your best version, but just talk about, you know, guys coming to Christ. I said, they're the same thing. When we talk about your best version, you cannot be your best version without Jesus Christ. It is your best version in Christ. That is your best version. And so, yeah. you know, when men can find freedom, they find freedom to serve in Christ. And so that's what yes. got, the, you and I are, have the same DNA that way. We are all about guys giving their lives to Jesus and then being free men so they can live out that purpose with holiness and truth yes. and, and um, vigor. And so your fifth point, and I'll let you just touch on this real quickly because you've already addressed it. You said, Hey man, you got to have an accountability partner. So yes. what is that? What is that? What, what, what is an accountability partner and what does he do? Well, yeah. An accountability partner and, you know, in our program, you know, cause I talk about, you know, checking in regularly is, um, you know, we built an app so that on a daily basis, you're checking in with your accountability is, Hey, you're identifying your emotions. Hey, how am I doing? Where am I at? And you're sharing that. So in two minutes, you know, man, you check in, you answer a couple questions, but man, you're staying connected on a daily basis. Uh, you know, when I got trained as a, you know, and to be a certified sex addiction therapist, I went through that training. Um, you know, there are a lot of other addiction, you know, professionals there, but they were all like, man, a porn addiction is the most difficult to break. And, mm. and so keeping guys connected on a daily basis is critical. A once a week meeting, um, you know, is good. Um, but for most guys, it's not enough. Um, and so for our six month program, um, man, we, we have guys that man, use our app to check in on a, on a daily basis. Um, and I think I mentioned this before, you know, man, we encourage guys, uh, you know, before, Hey, before you get into that more intense program, we have a 30 day challenge that, and is an opportunity, you know, for, you know, guys to begin just kind of processing some of these truths at a, at a higher level. Um, but we'll get into that in a minute. Well, I want to lead right into that because that's, okay. that's what we're all about. So you, you offer a free 30 day with these guys and, and we're going to, we're going to put the link in our show notes. We're going to put the link everywhere. So guys can get involved in that. It's basically the freedom which is your website forward slash 30 day. If they yep. do that, they can get in and join this thing. So, so when, so for 30 days, a guy can uh, have a free trial of your program. How do you suggest that that guy works through those 30 days. What's yeah. the, what's the most beneficial thing he can do? Yeah. Well, and I would say this, you know, and it's not just a free trial. I mean, it's a 30 day program, but our, our main program is also free. Well, I, I thought so. Yeah. I thought you had yeah. said that last time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's all free. Um, and you know, we have a pay it forward model. Hey, once you find freedom, man, we ask you to pay it forward for the next guy. Um, but yeah, the 30 day program, um, man, is, is something, you know, we encourage guys to go through with other men, but when you sign up each day, you get an email, um, each morning and it has 10 minutes or less of content, you know, a short video, a passage of scripture, you know, to meditate on, you know, a few key thoughts, but related to this area of purity. Um, but man, the, the cool thing is, Hey, you can go through it with some other men. We have a small group, um, little discussion guide. So sometimes guys will be like, Hey, let's do a five week study every day. There's a little bit of content and then they'll, they'll get together, you know, once a week and discuss it, you know, from the, the previous, um, you know, seven days and, uh, man, men have done this with their son, their teenage son. And who struggles with a, you know, pornography uh, struggle, um, you know, a lot of, you know, small groups, but it's an easy thing to say, 
hey, man, I'm going through this 30-day program just to grow in my purity. Man, you want to join me? Um, and, man, it, it's it been powerful because it starts guys talking on some of these topics. It brings in the brain science uh, piece. It brings in some of the shame piece that we've talked about and really looking at, man, this whole addiction piece, uh, really from a holistic you know standpoint, spiritual, physical, emotional. Um, and so, man, it's, it's been, uh, it's been powerful. Um, and so it's, yeah, simple to go sign up and, and again, it's, you know, and another way guys have used it is they like started a group chat, uh, or a group text and man, each day they'll just share, Hey man, what'd you get out of the lesson today? And man, they'll just kind of keep a group chat going for 30 days, just as accountability. And so it's been, it's been super encouraging how, uh, God has used this really to kind of launch guys and groups, um, man, towards freedom. Well, so as I'm hearing you speak, I'm thinking to myself, okay, so the guys listening to our show right now, we have probably four categories of guys when it comes to an addiction. We have guys that are probably fully addicted and know it to some something, right? Yeah. We have guys that probably are addicted, but they're in denial. We have guys who I would say are hobbyists. They're not addicted, but they they overindulge in what pornography or alcohol or whatever it is. And then we have guys that don't have a problem They're, they they mm. are walking in freedom. That is okay. Would what I'm hearing you say though, I'm hearing you say that doesn't matter where you are in those categories. This is a great way to step in and grow yes. in your purity and holiness. So that when you said that, I thought, man, you're hooking me. Well, well, <laughs> I might just is, do this. This hey, is good. Hey. Jim, I, I think you should do this, man. I think it I think it would equip you because this is such a massive issue. And if this generation of men want to impact the younger generation coming up, this is a topic that we need to be equipped in so that we can help the next generation. And so by all means, it's man, hey, if if you don't have a struggle in this area man, use this as an opportunity to equip yourself. And I, I promise you, you'll gain some principles from the scriptures that will help you walk more in purity, more in line with who you are in Christ. And, um, but it will, man, it will really equip you uh, to help others who do struggle. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm really going to consider this. I'm I'm really serious dude, because I'm dude, a take the take well, the challenge. Well, dude. here's the oh whoa, you just called Come me on, out, man. You just called me out in front of thousands of people. Man, I like you. Anyway, um, I love being called out, by the way. But um, you know, this is this really inspires me because I'm a I'm a massive fan of personal growth. Massive. So when I get challenged, I go, man, okay, this is really good. So I'm gonna I am gonna personally cons I'm not gonna say it when I do decide I'll let the guys know on this yeah. podcast, but I'm going to really consider this. Yes. I, I really appreciate it. I think you're the first guy that's called me out on the podcast. This is really good. <laughs> so man, I pray Ted, I I'm all joking aside. I'm not joking about this program though. I'm going to really seriously consider it. And before I say yes, I want to make sure I've got a group of guys to go in it with me. Yes. So that's why That'd I'm hesitating awesome. here. So uh, I thanks so much for coming on again. I just, uh, you know, you have these guys in the show times so, sometimes you're like, man, I wish we lived closer. I would really like this guy. And so uh, I really appreciate you. I hope that uh, and, and pray that we continue to have this relationship. And uh, thanks for sharing your heart for men. Absolutely. Well, Jim, I appreciate your ministry and man, all, all that you're doing to uh, and call men up to a higher standard and vision. I appreciate it. Hey, men, hey, men, while you're at it, men, head on over to our website, menarena.org. After you go to Ted's website, head over to ours. Grab your free copy of my book, Tell Them What Great Fathers Tell Their Sons and Daughters. And the first thing you're going to see on our homepage is a button that says join our program. That's how you join a small group. So between Ted's ministry and ours, man, plug into a small group. Until next time, feel the wet sand on the arena floor. Hear the deafening roar of the crowd. Taste the sweetness of victory. Smell the stench of battle. Get in the game. Get dirty. Grind it out. And be a man.
You've been listening to the Men in the Arena podcast. If you hunger to be your best version, then join thousands of men from around the world in our Men in the Arena forum on Facebook. This is the best place to have open discussions around the topic of biblical manhood. Make sure to explore our website at meninthearena.org, sign up for the weekly equipping blast, and take advantage of our many free resources designed to help you become your best version of a man. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Men in the Arena podcast. Remember, when a man gets it, Everyone wins.